Zola Levitt presents with Miles and Katherine Weiss. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts, then, and now. The story continues. Shalom and welcome to Zola Levitt Presents. I'm Miles Weiss. This is my wife, Catherine, my co-host. And today we're continuing in our series, Acts, then and now. The story continues. This story is so dear to our hearts, Miles, mm -hmm. because it's about the one new man. And Miles being Jewish and me being a Gentile, God has brought us together and we're one in Messiah. Yes. You know, he's broken down the middle wall of partition and given us the way in, both Jew and Gentile, into the Holy of Holies. So let's go now and hear some teaching from Ephesus. Here we are in Ephesus, one of the wonders of the ancient world. And when Paul came here, there was no slight stir. What a commotion was stirred up because of the clash between Paul bringing knowledge of the God of Israel to a place that was given over to every kind of God. You know, this letter to the Ephesians was written by Paul when he was in prison in Rome. And it was a way of encouraging the body here. The body of believers here needed to be encouraged and strengthened. They had had a good foundation, solid foundation. And in fact, the letter to the Ephesians is one of the most powerful letters that we have because it really tells the gospel story in terms of our own personal walk with Yeshua, with Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul was doing in this letter. It speaks to us even today in the early chapters of this letter, he speaks about the place that we have with Christ. If we know him, if we have a real relationship with him, Paul lets us know through the Ephesian letter that we're seated in heavenly places. That's our starting point. And because we're seated in heavenly places, Christ himself gives us the fellowship, the ability to walk with him, goes on to say, to walk in him in love in such a way that we are able to have a transforming effect on the world around us. And once we are doing that, recognizing we're seated in heavenly places, we recognize that we are able to walk in love because of who He is. And finally, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and following, He lets us know that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. And He shows us how to put on the armor of God and to wage a spiritual war. Remember, we do not war against flesh and blood. This is not a national issue. This is a personal issue of being able to recognize that we're seated in heavenly places, and then recognize because of that we are empowered to walk in love and then we can stand against the work of the enemy who always comes to bring division and to bring chaos and harm. You know, it's an amazing story because what happened here was the uproar was based in the idea that he was coming to preach an unknown God, preach a different God, and came against the finances that were being made here at the temple of Diana, the temple of Artemis. In fact, the Ephesians, led by Alexander the coppersmith, the, 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 the Ephesians were yelling in the streets, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And there was a great commotion stirred up between those that were making money off of the silversmithing and all the brass work, all the work that was done here to making idols was coming under scrutiny now because Paul was coming and speaking about this God who was the creator of the heavens and the earth and could not be contained in a temple, could not be contained in anything that was made by man. And so the tension was very, very uh, strong. It was a very intense time for Paul. It was a very strong time of bringing the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he said to them, have you been baptized? And there was questions. They had questions about which baptism. Was it the baptism of John? That was an unnamed baptism to repentance? Or was it a new baptism? And Paul had to instruct them. He had to let them know 
that this was a baptism that was coming to them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was a new thing. And with that came the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. Miracles, signs and wonders, acts then, acts now. We'll be hearing more about that later in the series. This is an amazing part of the story because you can go through the Ephesian letter and orient yourself around how to live the Christian life. It's a real gift to us today. So when we speak about Acts then and Acts now, one of the greatest key letters that we have is the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians when he was in prison in Rome. And so we're going to look even deeper into some of the words that he brought to them and to encourage them, to help them to live the life in Yeshua's name. Amen. For insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. When you call, be sure to ask for our free catalog with the latest videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies includes reading packets, teaching CDs, and mail-in tests. You may want to join us on an upcoming tour of Israel or Petra, or cruise the Mediterranean visiting Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. We're here in Ephesus in the home of a wealthy person. This is an amazing place that's being unearthed right now. And it may have been a place that Paul stayed, we don't know for sure, but it was not far from here in the theater where Paul was resisted by Demetrius and Alexander. And he makes note of that in Acts 19. He speaks about how the word coming in has challenged the finances of the city because so much money was being made in the making of artifacts to Diana, the goddess. And here comes Paul with the word of the Lord. Here comes Paul with the word of the one true God, and it upset the city of Ephesus, but it was stirred up even further by the bringing of the power of the Holy Spirit and people getting baptized, and a, just a real revolutionary new thing was taking place in Ephesus. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it from Rome when he was in prison to the Ephesians, and he reminds them of this in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, By grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. And isn't that the word for us, that we do not come to faith because we had a bright idea, or we suddenly understood who Jesus is. No, it is faith that is given to us by God. And this letter comes down through the ages and speaks to you and speaks to me. And then Paul goes on to do something that is unbelievable. It is such an amazing word because he goes on to say in Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15, He himself is our peace, who has made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments. He's going on to speak and turn the world right side up by saying it is not that Jewish people are now becoming Christian people, but rather he's speaking to the pagan world and saying you are now being brought into the commonwealth of Israel. And he's speaking to us about the one new man. Wow, this is the place if Ephesus, where this letter that has the full gospel in it and preaches to us about how to live the Christian life and speaks to us so clearly about the one new man. You know, we hear that phrase more and more around the world, which is a good thing. More and more often, churches and believers are understanding that they are grafted into the life of Israel. They are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. They are grafted in to the life of the Jewish people and the state of Israel, the people of Israel, especially the believing community in Israel. Now, as this series unfolds, you're going to hear this more and more because the one new man is the heartbeat of God's desire that he would have a bride made up of Jews and Gentiles together. 
And I believe that this letter, almost more than any other of Paul's epistles, speaks so clearly to us about that process, that uh, no longer individual Jewish people coming into a new religion, but rather he's speaking to the entire world and opening the doors because of the work of the cross. He's opening the door for Gentiles to be brought into the house of Israel. What a change. What a difference. Today in Israel, this is being played out. Just as Paul wrote to the people in Ephesus, we're seeing it played out in Israel as, believe it or not, Jews and Arabs are worshiping God together because of the work of the cross. We'll meet some of our friends who are living that life where they're seeing Jewish people and Arab people in perfect harmony, perfect peace, born again together of one spirit, the spirit of Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And what a miracle to see that taking place in our day. I believe we're going to see more and more as the day approaches, as that day approaches, the day of the Lord coming. We're going to see more and more of these walls continuing to be broken down and Jews and Gentiles, even Jews and Arabs, worshiping Jesus together. The Bible Lands. You've read about them. Now encounter them for yourself. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus at the Jordan, Galilee, Jerusalem. Journey in the shadow of Paul to Athens, Corinth, Ephesus. Join Miles and Catherine Weiss on a tour of the Bible Lands and witness the Word come to life as never before. Call 1-800-WONDERS. That's Israel. We love it, and I know you do too. And we want to show it to you. We'd love you to come on a tour with us. We'd love to show you the land of covenants where the Bible comes alive and you get to walk in the ancient footsteps of our Messiah. Oh, man, we would love to be with you in Israel as soon as you're able. And in the meantime, a really good way to know what's going on here at Levitt's ministry is to receive our newsletter, the Levitt Letter, which we produce every month and it is free to you, you can contact us at levitt.com. We'd be glad to send that to you. Our offer this week is one of my favorites. It's an epic love story written by myself, and it is a really good overview of the One New Man ministry. It's a really good picture of how God in these last days is opening up Romans 9 through 11, preparing us for Jesus' return, and really speaking about the middle wall of partition being broken down and Jews and Gentiles coming together to worship Him. So we want to offer that to you this week as well. Well, our next interview is with some dear friends of ours, David and Karen Davis, minister on Mount Carmel, where they are living out the breakthrough of the One New Man ministry, actually Arabs and Jews worshiping the Lord together on the top of Mount Carmel. It's like a piece of heaven. So we want to take you to our interview with David Davis right now from Mount Carmel. David, we've just come from Ephesus where we read the letter to the Ephesians that Paul yeah. wrote and tucked in there is that phrase, the one new man, I thought of you. <laughs> here on Mount Carmel. Can you tell me how you began this work and what's going on now? Well, that phrase, the one new man, has been tucked in my heart for, for, for many years, my wife and I. My wife's a Jew. I'm a Gentile. We met the Lord in New York City. We were working with David Wilkerson. We had a call then to move to Israel. So 22 years ago, we moved to Israel to start a rehabilitation center for Jews and Arabs together in the same building because we believe that God is restoring the one new man the way the body of Messiah began you know, 2,000 years ago. So as we moved to Haifa and got this old building, which was deserted, the Soviet Union collapsed, all the Russian Jews were coming back, Saddam Hussein was firing his missiles from the other direction. They were hitting Haifa, the mountain was shaking, we were running through the, you know, through the night putting on our gas masks, and when the war was over, we had this old building, and the battle began to start reaching drug addicts, and nobody in the body of Messiah in those years was reaching the Arab and Jewish drug addicts of Israel. And so many pastors here in the land had asked us, we, we need help with this, we don't know what to do. And so people started coming, they started getting saved. 
We had a Bible study. It exploded. People, other people started coming from Galilee and other places. Jews were coming to the Lord, prostitutes, people coming off of drugs, alcohol, people that had made Aliyah in recent years and local people. And my wife started doing some worship there. She's a worship leader and she's a Jew, of course. That we're singing in Hebrew, an Arab guitar player who now we've helped become a pastor. You, you've met him. He, he came and said he wanted to play uh, Messianic music on his guitar. So we had the One New Man Band on Mount Carmel. And we outgrew the House of Victory. So the Lord brought us up to the top of the mountain. Now we're up on, where we are now. We're on the top of Mount Carmel. And the Lord gave us this, this piece of land free. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, the Lord's heart is really into the one new man to see Jews and Arabs and Gentiles come to the Lord in the last days, and especially in the epicenter of it all where he's returning in Israel. So the Lord gave us this piece of land free, praise God, and this building we're sitting on is built on a huge bedrock. Everything we do needs to be built on the rock, Jesus, Yeshua. So Amen. the Lord taught us, restore the altar of the Lord on Mount Carmel. That was the vision for the congregation. And so the congregation, which is called Kehillah to Carmel or Carmel Assembly, um, we have 12 stones around the altar behind me. And the 12 stones, when Elijah restored the altar of the Lord, it was a prophetic act when he did it because the two southern tribes were separated from the, from the 10 northern tribes when he actually did it. So there was division. There had been a, you know, a civil war after the time of Solomon. And so restoring the altar of the Lord is a picture of the 12 tribes will eventually come back together. And Miles, it's happening now. You're Amen. on Mount Carmel where Jews are coming to the Lord in more numbers than any time since the book of Acts. And it's just the beginning. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so the Lord has just blessed this vision of the one new man, my wife's worship team, Jews. She has three Arabs on her worship team. And when we worship here on Shabbat, this whole place is packed out. We have to open up the walls. We've made these walls so they swing open. And God told us that if we would preach the pure word, preach an uncompromised word, and worship him in spirit and in truth, he would bring Jews and Arabs into the kingdom of God. And that's what he's doing here. It's an amazing story. And, and people in the West, we don't hear this good news. We hear the small version of the television news. But here you have all these stories of... Uh, of unity and, and, and shared faith that we, we never hear listen, about. W listen, we've had an ex-drug addict who is now our youth pastor, comes from Uzbekistan, from the former Soviet Union. He was married here under a hupa to his German wife. Hallelujah. Now listen, if you, can, if you can reconcile Jews and Germans in the one new man body, you can reconcile anybody. Amen. And so we have seen over and over again that the Lord wants to restore the vision to the church of Jesus Christ and the messianic body in the last days to go back to the way it was in the book of Acts. This is the way the church is going to end. And it started with Jews. And I love the story of Ephesus. I preach on it all the time. Paul got those 12 Jews that were on fire for the Lord. And they went into Ephesus, this horrible demonic stronghold with the statue of Diana. And he went to the synagogue. And the Jews came to the Lord. Then he got Gentiles. And they turned the whole city and that whole part of Asia upside down. The Gentile church has to wake up that the gospel came from the Jews. And they have a tremendous debt to the Jews. This is what we teach here. This is what we w see happening here. We have Arabs that we work with. We have Arab congregations that we go to. We, we worship the Lord in Hebrew and English. We had a reconciliation meeting with an Arab church recently. My wife, was, my, who's Jewish, was singing in Arabic. It, God is able to put the, the to, to graft the, the, the natural branches back into the tree and put those wild olive branches in there in the tree of Israel. And the roots go all the way down to the patriarchs and the Bible and the prophets, and most of all, the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. Let's get back to the way it's supposed to be and watch a great move of God in Israel, and then the Lord's going to return because it's going to be life from the dead, even to America. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> David's reference to a great move of God here in Israel is exemplified in this praise and worship by the one new man, Jews, Arabs, Gentiles, all singing together in Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, and English. It's an amazing time to be together with them as they praise the Lord in multiple languages. Karen, David's wife, is the worship leader here at Kehillat HaKarmel. Karen, we know that the inspiration for music comes from the Lord, but could you tell our viewers something about the uh, current events and the Bible, how that, the interplay works for that? 
you know, when the Lord positioned us here on the top of Mount Carmel, um, he said to us from Isaiah 42 that we were to shout from the top of the mountains to give glory to the Lord and he would go forth and prevail against our enemies. And so we understand we, that we are in the midst of a spiritual battle and living in Israel, we are definitely on the front line of the battle. So we are dealing with the tensions of current events. We're dealing with, um, we're always dealing with what's going to happen tomorrow. As a worship leader, sometimes I have to stand up and lead the congregation, and we just had a, a, a suicide bombing on the streets of Haifa. And so, you know, I have to find that place in my own spirit where I am able in spirit and truth to, to lift my hands and say, Hodula Dunai Kitov, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And it's only by the spirit of God that we are able to say that he's good in the face of, of horrors that happen. It's amazing. And so some of the music has its roots in tradition, but then it's informed by what's happening right now spiritually. Yes. I mean, we, we, we've been asking the Lord, I mean, since we've been on this mountain, we said, Lord, release to us uh, this, the new songs, the sound of heaven that will carry the textures and the rhythms and, and the scriptures that will launch the scriptures like, uh, like a like a missile into the principalities and powers of darkness to declare the wisdom of God. And um, so the Lord's been releasing to us new songs in Hebrew um, in answer to that prayer. But mixed in with that, we also um, love to sing so traditional Jewish songs that are based on the scripture, like Hine Matov, Hine Matov Umanayim, sung at every wedding, Jewish wedding, bar mitzvahs, every Jewish celebration, part of our culture as Jewish people. Um, but it's Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There he commands the blessing. And so when we sing that, uh, we're, we're declaring that. And we, actually, we, we're singing that in the context of really being the one new man of Jews and Arabs singing together. We have Arabs, musicians, and people in the congregation uh, joining into these wonderful uh, Jewish traditional songs in the light of what Messiah has done for us. I've actually heard that from people who have been to your congregation. They, they would say, I, it was like heaven. I heard Arabic and Hebrew right. and English and Russian yes. all being sung. Yes, that's right. I mean, we sing um, the song that, that, that's so well known, When David Danced, When the Spirit of the Lord Moves on My Heart. I will and we sing it in Hebrew, but we also sing it in Arabic. Mm. And uh, like David danced, and the Arabs danced like David danced. And they, they are actually being brought into an understanding that they too are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. And so with their awareness of Yeshua comes a love for the Jewish people? That's right, that's right. Um, it's something supernatural that God has been doing in our hearts, and he did it in my heart as a Jew. I came to this land with just a deep burden for my own people, uh, with the joy and the love that I had received from knowing Messiah. I just, I was so aware of the suffering and the grief that was in the heart of my own Jewish people. So when we arrived here, Ironically, the first invitation that my husband and I had to minister was in an Arab congregation in Galilee. And we're driving, we're on our way to this little meeting, and I suddenly realized that my heart was cold for the, toward the Arabic people. That, um, and I, I, I said to my husband, I, I can't go in there and sing in spirit and truth, and I, I don't feel anything for these people. I didn't come here for them. In fact, they're my enemies, and, and they don't even want me here. And, and so we pulled the car over, we stopped on the side of the road, and we began to pray. And I suddenly got this, the, 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 the scripture from Matthew 5, I think 46, that says, how are you any different from the tax collector if you only love your own brothers? Wow. And I, the Lord was saying, I am calling you to a higher call than that. And I went in and I heard Arabic sung for the first time in my life as a language of love, as a language of beauty. And my heart changed. There are times when um, we've just had a suicide bombing, for instance, or the rockets are coming in from Hezbollah. And uh, my way of pouring out my heart before the Lord is usually to come to the keyboard and just begin to play, you know, the, just begin to move my hands in a chord pattern and, and wait on the Lord. And often what will happen is a scripture comes, just comes into my spirit. And I realize that that's what the song is about. And it's an answer, it's a response of the spirit to what we're facing. We need to sing a certain word and it's the word of God that, that, um, that brings light, the entrance of his word brings light and that we can stand in hope and faith in the midst of darkness. 
Since meeting David and Karen Davis, we've really picked up the call to minister as the one new man to the one new man. In fact, back in our home congregation, we've worked together with Walid Shobat, an ex-PLO terrorist, and Hormoz Shariat, an Iranian pastor who preaches the gospel into Persia, and even a local Arab pastor has stood with me in order to proclaim the good news, Jew and Gentile, together. Right. We had a conference called The One New Man, and we saw a Muslim woman that when she first came, we were a little afraid, but God did such a work in her heart that He really healed her of her hatred mm -hmm. and actually gave her a full desire uh, to see the Jewish people in their land yes. in a prayer of that. It's amazing yeah. what God can do when we worship Him the way He calls us to worship Him. And so as we go today, we want to remind you, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, an epic love story, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah by Miles Weiss. This booklet answers some questions you may have about timely and vital issues. For example, is Jesus coming soon? How did the church lose its Jewish identity? What is the shared destiny of Jews and Christians? An epic love story will take you on a journey through time into the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul when he was inspired to write to the Roman church. Call 1-800-WONDERS and ask for an epic love story. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com, along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule, and much more. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.